Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to Fallen London. Today we're going to be carrying on with the exceptional story, Deja Vu. Your body is ready for bed, but your mind is still alive with sensory details from opening night. The glittering outfits, the wild music, the heat from so many bodies in motion. You prowl your lodgings. London will begin to wake up within an hour or two. Let's settle down. You have techniques you can employ, and sleep is elusive. You linger at the window for a moment, touched by an unusual restlessness. Is it time to change your lodgings? To gain a fresh perspective? You glance into the corner. No hooded figure. You lie down and slow your breathing. You dwell on familiar things, on upcoming chores. For a minute or two, you consider the likely future of the weary debaucher. The bed is comfortable. Your arms become heavy. Your shoulders relax. Your eyes close. Why are we in the parabola? Oh no, this doesn't look like London. You stand on a river crossing. It's stone-worn from hundreds of years of footfall. Jewelers and goldsmiths line the thoroughfare, and a few tiny residences perch atop them. East and west the river stretches, tinged with hints of violent and pelican. The shops are all closed up. Heavy wood shutters conceal the wares within locked in place with formidable iron bolts. Let's get our bearings. This is surely Parabola. But the topography is unusually precise. You look around and steady yourself on the stone wall. Although it has the feel of a real location, the edge is a little misaligned, like old pigments separating from a clean brushstroke. You have a dizzy moment of deja vu. The city extends on both sides of the bridge. As you look, the first merchants begin to arrive, yawning and rattling heavy old keys. Beyond them, to the north, you see... Are those dancing couples? Have you spent too long in the Portinari lately? Even some of the faces look familiar. You glance south. There are dancers there too. One by one, the shops open for trade. Masterfully crafted rings, bracelets and pendants glint beneath alluring lighting. Well, annoyingly, I am not a Cosmogon spectacles man. I don't have the uh, silverer. Is that the name of that profession? Somebody who professionalizes in the parabola. So it looks like we're doing this the old fashioned way. Let's browse the jewelry shops. Everything is so shiny. The shops are small and centuries old, built into the very stone of the bridge. The displays are fitted with dark wood shutters. Lions' heads stare from the masonry around them. Each shopkeeper is quietly pleased to see you, deferential, patient. They show off their wares and offer little samples. Samples? But a jeweler's? Oh, don't mind if I do. I guess we'll go south, between high walls. A formidable facade with three rows of arches dominates a wide, sloping approach. From somewhere nearby, you catch the woody scent of spring growth. Street artists crowd out the dancers here, painting and gossiping. When away from their easels, they are continually checking out the work of their rivals. Huh. We're at the palace. There's a few options here. Let's start at the top. Let's visit the palace galleries. They are open to the public. 
You walk beneath ornate frescoes, past Renaissance masterworks. Consecutive paintings tell a story in shifting oils. A woman flees from a city of water to marry her beloved. The particularities of life bog her down. Her husband's family are impoverished, and he cheats with the women of the court. Her beauty turns the head of a great duke, but he is also married. They embark on an affair, and the woman's husband is struck down in the street, perhaps by a jealous lover, but the assailant is rendered in shadow. That obstacle removed, the duke installs the woman in a palace near his own. The next painting is dated six years later. The duke's wife dies, and the lovers are finally married. They have less than ten years together before the final painting, where death reaches out for them. You've heard a story about patience. Interesting. Let's survey the street art. The new pieces are a riot of bold styles. In contrast to the old masters inside, the newly created works here display fearless innovation. Double layered boards with peep through windows, paint flourishes which extend into the frame and somehow onto the foundation wall of the palaces. The pigments separate and rejoin before your eyes, tantalizing you with hints of the neath bow. You stop before one piece in particular. The figures are grotesque, representing emotion rather than anatomical accuracy. But the setting is clearly London, with the House of Chimes visible over the roof. Nothing monstrous is happening in an alley. You are unlucky, can we try again? You are unlucky again? Again? I was unlucky again? Is this 50% or am I just really unlucky? Again? I don't think this is possible. <laughs> 50% my ass. One more time. Ugh. Never mind. One more. I it's impossible. It's impossible. That's not that's that's it's not true. I refuse to believe that I would fail 10 times in a row. <laughs> One more. Nope. Oh, let's approach the Stygian colorist. She is focused on her work. You linger for a moment, watching the colorist's brush flick from the clean water pot to the pigments. She is painting an architectural fantasy. She lays down colorless strokes on the cotton page, filling an area with moisture. Then she moves the brush to the palette, loads it with paint, breathes and dips. Colour spreads out across the paper like accumulating raindrops. Eventually, you address her by name. She does not seem to hear you. You touch her shoulder. No reaction. Interesting. Go north. Will be the bridge again, yes? So let's go northeast. Through arches into a crowd. Above you looms a cubicle building of russicated stone. Rows of windows break the surface beneath projecting battlements. High above, a clock tower stretches for the sky, sketched in violent. Citizens flood in and out of the building, arguing or embracing, accompanying both with wild gestures. Around the fringes, Couples dance, weaving their way through others like ribbons spilling from carefree air. My scandal is not very high right now, but we could help senior residents. Here and there, older people struggle to participate in civil life. Let's drink from the fountain? A water god stands at its centre. In the ripples, you see a woman with tight blonde curls, far from home. Restricted to the building, 
while her husband seeks lovers out in the city. She wanders the courtyard. The father-in-law notices her low spirits, and he commissions local artists to help. In half-moon panels around the courtyard, they paint the distant towns of her youth. We've heard a story about thoughtfulness. We can go southwest, or we can go north. Which way's backwards? Is north backwards? No. The bell tower. The tower rises adjacent to a vast cathedral. From a square base, it extends to 40 or 50 times your height. The exterior is white marble, detailed in red and green. Geometric and flower motifs flank the sculptural elements. Behind, an immense orange dome peers down at you from its round window. The area in front of the bell tower is in chaos. Groups laugh and stare, and above all, they dance. Progress through them is almost impossible. Ah, if our suspicion is too high, we can lend assistance to the ambulance crews. Volunteers sit in the shade, watching the crowd. Carts await behind them, loaded with stretchers. Presumably, they do not normally have to fight through a crowd of dancers. And go northwest? Dancers spill into the surrounding streets? Could go east? Through the shadow of the dome? That needed the colorist. We can go south, press through a mass of curious dancers. Let's follow the one that has the colorist and see where it takes us. Let's go east. The hospital. A long, arched portico flanks three sides of a busy, open court. Volunteers arrive with carts bearing the wounded and invalid. Inside, you glimpse airy wards and busy nurses. You dancers drift through the court, blocking the carts. Irritated volunteers shove them out of the way. I can give coins to a beggar? She has sharp eyes beneath her raggedy hood. Sure. Thank you, my lady, she says. How does she know you? She lifts her head and gazes into your eyes. Always good people come here, caring for others. It was a banker set it up. Saw the end of his life coming, and he got to thinking about all that money and what it meant for his soul. His children's governor's was a pious woman, a woman of charity. She said, build a hospital for the city. He did, and she worked here, healing for the rest of her life. Then came a charitable order of women, then a religious order. Still here, hundreds of years later. What will happen to your soul? With an odd smile, she gathers up your coins and moves off. Back to the city. I, uh, yeah, no, I'm doomed. I, I apparently have far too many pennies. Uh, let's put it that way. Now we gained a loving touch story and we learned a ch story about charity. Charity is fantastic. Q standard YouTube shill about memberships down below and direct donations on coffee. Thank you very much. Uh, let's, let's examine a floor in the city. One of the pillars on the portico looks peculiar. Draw closer. An irregular distortion hangs in the air across the pillars. Its vertical lines are diverted diagonally to a point which should be structurally unsound, but the arch remains secure. Furthermore, all the pigment is missing. The city behind looks like a monochrome ink sketch, awaiting attention from the painter's brush. Some dream logic compels you to reach for the distortion. You find you can take hold of the edge and peel it away, correcting the irregularity. It folds into your hand, rolling between your fingers like a jellyfish. You peel the monochromatic floor from the fabric of your dream. All right, well, the only way we have go to go now is west. From here, you can catch glimpses of an immense Terracotta Dome.
Yeah, this is the bell tower, huh? Um, shall we go northwest? Because we can't climb the tower yet. Let's see where this takes us. The railway station. It is a small affair, crammed behind yet another church. Railway tracks run towards the horizon, blurred by violet. Two trains of Baroque design are pulled up at the buffers. Passengers throng the forecourt. The air is alive with the buzz of conversation. Spy the young man you helped up from the Portinari dance floor. Let's start by checking the timetable. Perhaps that is somewhere you would like to go. You examine the posted timetable. Its language is not English. For a moment you think you have it, and it slides away from you with the elusiveness of dream. The letters blurring and smearing. All the destinations begin with P. Instead, you concentrate on the train times, fixing their numbers to the board with sheer determination. It has been a busy day of trains in and out. But below, a certain number. The times are all blank. You check the last train. 1899. You look at the clock. 1899. Hmm, how curious. Let's look for anomalies. Not every detail is consistent with a real train station. You scan the forecourt. The features shrink away from your gaze, smearing and eluding focus. Just beside the buffet, two naked bohemians are draped on a velvet chase. They look around from time to time, seemingly aware that they are in a public railway station, but unwilling to moderate their behaviour. You don't recognise them from the Portinari reopening night. They are not dancing. This is perfectly normal in uh, in London. Just, you know, two naked bohemians on a velvet chase in the middle of a train station. It's probably some sort of artistic piece. Perfectly normal. Alright, let's... Uh, approach the diffident dramatist. He seems absorbed by the passing travellers. You follow the dramatist for a while. He is fascinated by the encounters all around him. Here, a couple with identical beards are reunited. They hug so vigorously you fear their facial hair will generate sufficient heat for combustion. There, a pickpocket works her trade, bumping and dipping and handing off. A ticket collector takes note, and she peels away to a distant corner. Begin again. And there, a tearful couple prepare for separation, their need for each other radiating waves of violet. They never actually part. Try to attract the dramatist's attention, but he moves on to the next little scene. Hmm. So now we've met him. Can we go back? Is it southeast? No. I thought. Oh, we need to find four flourishes and dreams, and we found two. Let's go south. Pass through a mass of curious dancers. Where does this take us? Oh, it takes us here to the town hall. Well, let's go east. These narrow ways are written in shadow. We needed. Our oh, dramatist here. The square. Shuttered buildings tinged with cosmogon fade one another across a wide public space. Beneath canopies on the ground floor, leather workers stitch and die. A three peaked basilica forms the eastern side of the square. Dancers sway and glide across the central area. Shoes scraping on a patchwork of rough stone. We can fix our nightmares here, which are fine, I believe. Yes. Uh, but let's examine the statue. A frowning man in a laurel wreath gazes down upon the square. An eagle peers up at him, unconvinced. 
As you intercept the sightless gaze of the statue, a scene swims before your eyes. A woman in white, walking a riverside street. She sees this man and greets him. He turns and runs. Later, he writes a sonnet, and from those words, new life springs. Okay, well we can eavesdrop on an arguing couple. This uses the dramatist. Their loud exchange is inappropriate for such a public space. The woman's wrath is laced with gant. The man's anger is drenched in a pockian. For short bursts, the argument makes sense. She spends too long with her writer friends. He drinks too much. But as you listen, it loses its thread. He spends too long with an immense Z turtle. She drinks in Somnio Fathoms. They are only together because of a pool surrounded by gr glass chrysanthemums. You reach into the air between them. Dream barbs and vibrating anger accumulate in your palms. You press everything together and are left with a hazy, spiky ball. The couple stop shouting. The man puts his arm around the woman, and they stroll off in peaceful companionship. I've extracted an incoherent argument. Hmm, so what have we missed? We can go north again, or we can... I think that's to the hospital, right? We can go west. Long streets diverge, then converge in the shadow of the river. What's west? Oh, we're here again, okay. Uh... Go east again. North is definitely the hospital, right? Yep. Let's go... Hmm. Go west? We can't climb the tower because we don't have enough flourishing in dreams, so I'm missing something. Let's go south and then southwest? South again? Aha! Show the visual distortion, the Stygian colorist. A frown creases the forehead beneath those ink black locks. She is not progressing her painting. The colorist notices you at last. She extends an exploratory hand and squeezes the floor you took from the hospital, peering at it. There's something wrong with the colours. She shivers and hugs her chest. This is no dream of mine. It's about the end, isn't it? We'll be left behind, abandoned. Her face is aghast. You suggest you could leave with you? Yes. She says immediately. She slips her damp painting into a fold-up easel and lifts her stool. Let's go. Ah, ah, so now if I go... East again here. Can I... Wait, no, he was at the... Re oh, no, he was at the station, wasn't he? Hang on, if I go west... North again? To the train station? Ah, northwest. Here we go. Here we go. Tell the diffident dramatist about the argument you interrupted. He seems ill at ease now. The dramatist blinks at you. You relate the odd argument you heard in the square. He strokes the sharp tips of his form. I thought what I overheard here was all great material, he says. People saying what they really think at last, with no inhibition about their status or social taboos. After a while, it veered off into bizarre images, talking at cross purposes. There is something there, an energy, but it's not anything you could put into a play. Not a good one, at least. He turns to the exit. I'm done here, he says. Here we go, we now have two companions, which means 
I think we can climb the bell tower. Here we go. The door is open for your group at last. Oh, we have new text based on who was with us. I didn't notice. Anxiousness is tangible in the crowded square. It permeates the area like stale sweat. This is not going to have a happy ending, whispers the diffident dramatist. Let's climb the tower. The door is open for your group at last. This will move the story on. Be sure you've done everything you want to here. I have indeed. The dramatist steps aside to allow the colorist entry into the tower. He pauses and cocks an eyebrow. Hoping any monster inside will eat me first. She begins to insist on going first. She smiles and ventures in. Together, you ascend through deep shadow. There are hundreds of stairs. You pass three logias, their windows offering even higher views of the city's terracotta rooftops. The colorist makes some remarks to the dramatist that you do not catch. Finally, a bath of Cosmogon announces the final stairs. The colorist is the first to reach the balcony. Oh no, he says, voice thick with horror. The dramatist stops at the top of the stairs and claps a hand to his mouth. You edge him aside and step up to look. The sky is obscured by roiling, overwhelming mass of black and fluttering wings. Bats. They approach from all sides in undulating the city with seemingly infinite numbers. As they land on every roof, gripping chimneys and gutters, the sun is inexorably covered over. The bell tower trembles beneath you. And we're in London again. A cold morning. London. Rather too early. Once again. And come to? You're in your lodgings, you think. Your own bed. It was a dream. An unusually vivid, coherent dream. In which you were lucid and met with other Londoners. It was, in short, a honey dream. But you did not take any honey last night. Something makes you glance into the corner. The hooded figure is there again. No. Just your imagination. As alertness returns, you hear a restrained but persistent noise. Somebody is knocking at your door. And I think this is where I'm going to leave this episode. So thank you all so much for watching. Please like, subscribe, let me know what you think. Your comments are greatly appreciated. Thank you again to the members of the channel and the coffee supporters. It really does mean the world to me and it really does help keep making these videos. But as always, I'll see you next time.